real quick by showing you a YouTube video. Um, I'm going to hit play. I assume you guys will be able to hear the audio from the video, but if not, will you let me know? Yeah. All right, here we go. These fish we're seeing today, I mean, it's pretty neat that they came from the ocean. They bypass straight bass and tuna and whatever other fish are out there. And now they're in the rivers and they basically run out of the gas and hit these dams. These fish are active fish. They migrate in the spring um, from the ocean to spawn. And it's kind of a neat progression. Early spring, you'll see the outlights first, and then you'll see a mixture of hickory shad and American shad show up, and then the blueback herring. Before the dams were built, you know, way back in the 1700s, 1800s, these fish would migrate long distances in freshwater streams. In the Susquehanna River, they'd go in into New York. But then around the 1800s, 1900s, people built dams to run mills, and that blocked off this historic habitat for these fish, which is one of the reasons these fish have declined. Today we're at the Wilson Mill Fish Ladder. Uh, we're in Deer Creek. It's a tributary to the Susquehanna River. This fish ladder was built in the late 90s, and it's designed to get fish around man-made structures. Well, what you're seeing right here is the attraction flow. This is the entrance to the ladder. It looks really rough, but it actually slows the water down enough that these fish can come through here and go right up to the top of the ladder and get around the dam. The fish passage program was started in 1987 as part of a big program initiative to rebuild populations of migratory fish. And back then, the thing to do was to build fish ladders. And they're largely successful, I mean, they do work, they do pass fish, but they're not as efficient as taking out a dam. So now we're kind of moving away from fish ladders into dam removals. It's a far more effective way of passing fish. And it also addresses public safety. We've had some dams where people have drowned below them, uh, the liabilities. Many dams are no longer being used, so it just makes sense to take them out now. Of course, a lot of these dams are on private property, and it's it's difficult sometimes to convince a landowner to put a fish ladder on or to take a dam out. These dams are expensive to maintain, and if they can't afford to maintain it and they're not using it, they could get some grant money through my program and through some federal program to remove that dam uh, and restore passage for fish. They could have some, maybe some spawning fish on their property that they could catch recreationally. All right, so uh, did you guys hear that okay? I'm assuming, right? Yep. Awesome. So that was a Bay Program video that they that Will and my uh, some friends of mine put on and kind of summarizes the Fish Passage Program in a nutshell. I'll go into a little more detail about uh, what you saw in the video, and then I'll dive into the Whitehall Dam removal specifically um, near, uh, I guess, your place where you live. So... I'll start off talking about the fish passage program, uh, the decline of the American anadromous fish, which is kind of why the program got started. I'll talk about the types of blockages that we have in Maryland, then the types of fish passages. Uh, and I'm going to talk about American eels because um, they're a species that don't get a lot of attention. They've started to get some more attention more recently, but they play a huge role in the quality of our rivers that ties into fish passage. I'll talk about a new direction that the program is going into and how we prioritize blockages. And then I'll share some specific pictures on the Whitehall Dam removal uh, specifically, which is shown in this picture here. And anytime you guys have questions, go ahead and uh, either raise your hand or holler out. And I'll, uh, I guess Bron can just let me know when there's a question because I can't see the chat right now. So uh, the Fish Passage Program was uh, started in 1987. It's a Chesapeake Bay Agreement uh, as a fish passage commitment to provide fish passage at dams and remove stream blockages wherever necessary to restore passage for migratory fish. That's the, I guess, original goal of the Fish Passage Program, the original commitment, and that's why my program was started. I joined the program in 2004, and I've been there ever since. I, re I really enjoy it. It gives me something new to work on um, every day. I'm not doing the same sampling over and over again. I get to see all parts of the state, so it's really exciting for me. So, uh, American shad, hickory shad, and herring are all anadromous fish. Um, some groups I talk to don't know what anadromous fish are, and so I try to tell them uh, to think of salmon. You know, you see salmon on National Geographic or other television shows when they're migrating upriver and the bears are catching them. Those are anadromous fish. They're fish that live in the oceans and return to freshwater streams to spawn. Anadromous is a Greek word, which means running up or running. Uh, we don't have salmon in Maryland any longer, um, but we do have American shad, hickory shad, and herring. Um, and these are all very important fish in our, in our state. Um, 
Um, the program originally began because of the decline of American shad. American shad were really important commercial fish uh, back in the day. They even surpassed uh, rockfish and, and striped bass as a, and, I mean, striped bass and crabs and oysters in terms of commercial value in, in Maryland. Um, I think part of that is because, you know, way back in the 1800s, 1900s, uh, you know, people had a really tough winter. Spring was coming and then these fish would migrate in huge numbers and people would catch them commercially um, to eat them, to harvest them. And not only the fish, but also the roe, specifically American shad. Um, Alosa sapodisma is the a Latin name for American shad and it means tasty fish, I'm, I'm told. So um, they're very bony. I've never had an American shad. I've had herring, but they're very bony, but they taste uh, really good when they're smoked. Anyway, um, you see the landings here in this graph. 1880s, early 1900s, we had almost 8 million pounds landed annually um, in the Chesapeake Bay. And then those numbers really declined. You see a decrease on World War II and then um, a kind of a slight uptick. And then the populations really crashed. And the American shad fishery was closed in 81. Hickory shad closed uh, shortly after. And then herring closed in the, in the 90s. So migratory fish declined for many reasons. Um, pollution. Uh, you know, we weren't as very uh, pollution con pollution conscious back then. Uh, we'd often dump things in the rivers and just let uh, the rivers carry our trash and and waste away, dilute it. Um, <clears throat> sedimentation, you know, caused by deforestation, building towns uh, for fields, uh, for, for uh, agriculture. Um, all that sediment would wash out into the rivers and cover up the fish eggs. Uh, overfishing, as I said, these fish migrate in the spring in really large numbers, or especially uh, historically, and you could get um, just entire schools of fish in one or two landings of a same uh, net. Uh, this picture was taken in the mouth of the Susquehanna River, uh, Battery Islands, I believe it was, it was and, and um, when these fish come in big schools, they're just so easy to, to overfish them. And then construction of dams and other blockages. So as I said, these fish are migrating from freshwater streams or from the ocean into freshwater streams to spawn. And when dams are built that block their migration, they can't reach to that optimal uh, habitat for spawning. And so their numbers have declined because of that. And, you know, we've got regulations in place to deal with overfishing and pollution and sedimentation. And so it's kind of my job to work on the, or removing dams and providing for fish passage. So we have uh, lots of different blockages. We've got really large dams like this one on the Conowingo or Susquehanna River. This is Conowingo Dam in the upper left. Uh, the middle is a uh, three cell box carver on Route 50 on the way to Ocean City. We've got really small dams. We've got other kinds of uh, pipe culverts and large dams on the bottom right. And um, this dam in the bottom middle is also since been removed. This is on the Little Gunpowder. Um, near, it's called, we call it the Jarrettsville Dam. So lots of different shapes and sizes of dams. And uh, to try and get fish around them, we've come up with many different, um, I guess, ways to do that. So um, this is the um, East Fish Lift at Conlingo Dam. And I think the video is linked. If we have time, I'll show this video. It's kind of short, but I'll, I'll walk it through, walk you through it. See if this pulls up. How to kill all mosquitoes in the area in 90 seconds. Once I get rid of the ad. This is a, called a fish elevator. Um, this is the entire structure here, this gray structure. But this is a doorway that attracts the fish into the system uh, from the river. Uh, once the fish are inside, there's a temporary closure there that's used to kind of keep the fish in one place until there's enough to justify running the ladder because the ladder is slow. There's a person that sits in this booth and once they see that there are enough fish to, to run the elevator or run the fish lift, he'll hit a button, uh, it closes the gate and then it'll push all the fish over a hopper. You'll see here in a second that the doorway that was closed, which was right here is now open. And these fish are being crowded into a section where they can be lifted up by this big bucket or hopper, we call it. And this lifts them to the top of the dam. There's a, a latch just like this on the other side and it'll match up to right here. And when it does, these fish will come out of the hopper through a tube 
and now they'll be in the trough of the fish ladder at the very top. So all the fish now have been lifted up into this metal trough and they're going from right to left. And as they do, there's a box here and there's someone here that counts these fish as they swim by through a viewing window. And you'll get a chance to uh, see that here. And this is how one way we get population estimates of American shad. We've got several ways to collect species or data on the species. This is one way. We've got DNR crews that tag fish below the river. And then by seeing the number of tag fish that pass the ladder, we get a kind of crude uh, population estimate in the Susquehanna. Unfortunately, those numbers have been down for some time. This year was a slightly better year, but they're still way below what we'd like to see. But anyway, that's how the um, fish lift works at Conway Dam. It's the only the ladder of this type in Maryland. Um, for kind of medium-sized dams, we, we use what's called a Daniel fish ladder. And this is probably the most efficient design that we use here in Maryland. This is um, self-running, self essentially. This is a dam on Winter's Run um, uh, in the Bush River watershed, but this is the river in the upper left, and uh, it's angled so that these fish are swimming upstream. I'm not, can you guys see the cursor on my screen? Yes. Okay, so these, these fish are coming up here, and this is the entrance of the ladder right here. Uh, the water coming out attracts them to here, and the fish uh, kind of think that this is a stream, a freshwater stream, so they try to go up it. Uh, they'll come into the ladder here, kind of go around and up to the top, and this is where they exit. This is a trash rack that keeps debris from going into the ladder. Um, these wooden baffles slow the water down, and even though it looks really rough, um, it does slow it down enough for fish to pass it. Now, this is a, it's not a very efficient design. It's kind of the best we have, but even the ladders that are worked the best of this design are maybe only 30% effective. And it's kind of easy to see why when I show you this video that I put together. I'm not sure if there'll be an ad or not, but looks like not. So this is on, um, this is the video you saw. Oh, let me pause right here. So I've got a GoPro and I'm sticking it in the water below the dam. And you can see how just below the dam, how turbulent it is. I mean, that water is going through really fast. You can see herring swimming by. The herring that you're seeing here have already swam past the entrance of the ladder. So they've already missed it. And they can't really see where they're going. It's difficult. This uh, is the apron of the dam. And as I move the camera further to the right, I'll drop off into some deeper water uh, further below the dam, but you, every once in a while you'll see a fish pop up. There's a herring there. And they're really struggling to try and find out where to go. There's a big old carp. Uh, now I'm kind of dropping off the apron of the dam, and I'm kind of looking down towards where the fish ladder is. You can see these fish just kind of milling about. There's some gizzard shad, some carp, some herring. Uh, I want to back this up just a second. So I'm dropping the camera into the ladder now. To the left here, this is the entrance of the ladder over here. Uh, the GoPro was kind of off to the left of the screen before, but now I'm going to put it inside the ladder at the bottom. You can see what it looks like. These are fish are now, uh, these are mostly herring, a few gizzard shad, a few carp, uh, kind of going up into the ladder. I'll pan to the left here in a second. You can see the entrance to the ladder, but these fish are in the concrete raceway right now heading towards those wooden baffles that I showed you earlier. Um, but you can see quite a fish down below, quite a few fish down below. Here's the entrance of the ladder. That's out towards where the dam is. You, these are gizzard shad right here with a small herring mixed in. Um, you can see that that current is going pretty strong. They have to really kind of, you know, use some energy to go through this ladder right here. But you can see the numbers of fish below. It's quite a few fish, keep that in mind. Now I'm going to put the camera at the top of the ladder. Uh, these are the wooden baffles that you saw from above on the sides of the image. And uh, you can see the turbulence that those create. This is the very last ba uh, baffle. I'm at the very top of the ladder. And you can see not nearly as many fish as below are coming up, only a few of them. Um, so again, that just shows the efficiency or the inefficiency of these fish ladders. Of the fish that want to use it, 
only a fraction of them find the ladder and of the ones that find it only a fraction of those actually use the ladder so we say that if there's 100 fish below a dam that want to go upstream you know 30 at best are going to actually make it to the very top so i'll speak to why dam removals are so much better than fish ladders here later on i'm at the very very top of the dam um, above all the baffles this is a large school of fish that made it past all the baffles and all they got to do is go to the right and they'll be above the dam these are outway pairing here you can um tell by the size and the the how the real large eye on them gives them away this is how i pairing the eye diameter there so that's how the neil fish ladder works and again that last image you saw the camera was right about here and those fish were going this last little section to get above the dam this is an alaskan steep pass um, these are mainly used for small dams and culverts these are a one-shot prefabricated design uh, the fish enter down below and swim straight up to the top through these baffles, uh, baffles inside. Um, not very efficient, but, you know, in some structures that we can't take out, smaller structures is the best we can do. Dam, remo dam removals are by far the preferred approach. Um, this is the breach of the Bloody Dam. It's been the biggest dam removal in Maryland. It's one of the biggest removals on the East Coast. There's only a few of them in Maine that have been bigger than this. This was a multi-million dollar project, a very large project. Um, a sewer line went through the dam that we had to relocate first, which took up a considerable amount of money. Uh, and then we breached the dam September 11th, uh, I think 2011 maybe? No, 20, I think maybe 2016. But um, once the dam was breached, we went through with excavators and took the dam out. And this was considered a very successful project. We've since taken out... Uh, Simpkins and Union Dam on the Patapsco, and there's one main stem dam left that we're looking at taking out in the near future called Daniels Dam. Dam removals are preferred for many, many reasons. Um, the upper part of the, of the graph shows a free flowing river, nice gravel substrate, uh, nice current going through the river. Temperatures are cooler because the river's narrow, has tree cover. Um, Got lots of good places for bugs to hide in the rocks and, and gravel, and uh, it's just preferred by fish. Once we construct a dam, the water slows down because it becomes impounded. The river widens. We have less tree cover, so the water warms up. All that sediment that the river was carrying is now uh, being settled out onto the bottom. It covers up that nice substrate. Um, warm water has less dissolved oxygen, so it's, it facilitates algae blooms, uh, traps nutrients. And of course, if you're a fish coming upstream, you see the dam and say, damn. Public safety is a, is a big factor also. In fact, uh, the bloaty dam basically was removed because of public safety is the main factor, not for fish passage. This is bloaty dam before it was taken out. Uh, people sliding down into the water below. This is an article of a woman who was going down swimming and got stuck in the current below a dam in Hagerstown. So, it's not only for fish passage, but also for public safety reasons. Dam removals are, removals are way more efficient. This is the Simpkins Dam I told you about that's now since been removed. The dam is 293 feet from bank to bank. The Daniel Fish Ladder on the left side of the picture, uh, the entrance is like between three and four feet, very, very narrow. Um, and fish kind of get to the dam, they get turned around and confused. It's very difficult to even find the ladder. And then once they find it, only a few of them actually use it. So. Dam removals are way more efficient than constructing a ladder and are by far the preferred approach when possible. They require a whole lot less maintenance. Uh, the, dam the dam itself is a lot of maintenance, but so are the fish ladders. This is bloody dam before it was removed. The water would come over in high flow events. You can see the water was up to the here on the fence. Destroyed the fence, uh, trashed the grates, deposited large rocks and debris in the ladder. Uh, this is the upstream side of Daniel's Dam. Uh, this should all be free flowing water, but mud is, de is deposited during storm events and we have to clean that out so the ladder can work properly. So that's, it's a big problem and hard to maintain. So that's kind of a fish passage in a nutshell, why it got started, uh, how we get fish around dams and why we prefer dam removals. And why I have you guys here, I want to talk about the American eel because um, for me in the fish passage program, this is just really opened up my eyes as to why 
fish passage and restoring connectivity for aquatic organisms is so important. So the American eel is a catadromous fish. It's the exact opposite of the fish I just talked about. These fish spend most of their life in freshwater streams and go out to the ocean to spawn. All the eels from Maine to Florida all migrate, migrate out as adults. We call them silver eels when they get out to a, an out migration pattern. And they all go out to the Atlantic Ocean into the Sargasso Sea and spawn there. And then the young are carried back up to the East Coast uh, through the Sargasso Sea currents, the Gulf Stream currents from the Sargasso Sea. Um, they look like this when they're first born or hatched, or I guess born, but leptocephalus larvae. They're very uh, clear, see-through, very, very tiny. Uh, as they get closer to the coast, uh, we see glass eels, elvers, and then um, they turn into this yellow face where they spend most of their life in freshwater streams, which could be 10 to 20 years. So I'll explain why these guys are so important. Um, this is the Patapsca River. I was The dams I've been showing and talking about a lot are on here, listed here. Bloody Dam, Simpkins Dam, and Union have all three been removed now. Daniels Dam still remains that we're looking at taking out. It's a state-owned dam. Liberty Dam will not be coming out anytime soon. It's obviously a very important water supply dam, but it could have eel passage in the future, potentially. But before these dams were taken out, there was some data collected, and uh, you see these green and red dots on the map. The green dots show where surveys took place and they found eels. The red dots show where they did surveys and did not find eels. Now, this is Baltimore City Inner Harbor right here. So not the greatest um, watershed to work in, but the Patapsco upper watershed is actually surprisingly pretty good. Um, below these four main stem dams, you see quite a few sites where they found American eels. And many of these sites had an average of 30 to 40 eels. Above these four dams, though, you see very, very few green dots. In fact, there's only, I think, three or four. And uh, at those sites, I think we saw an average of two or three eels. So the dams really did block the eels from going upstream. And that just kind of illustrates why passage is so important. Now, people might say, well, you know, so what? Why is it uh, when I give these presentations to school kids, they like eels are gross. Why do we care about eels? Well, uh, there was a guy named Bill Lellis did a presentation for the Fish Passage Work Group a number of years ago, and this was probably the, I guess, the biggest uh, piece of information that I saw that really impact, impacted me and why I want to take dams out and restore passage. But he did a survey in the Delaware River, which, as we know, is next to the Susquehanna River, very close to it. He surveyed 123 miles of river uh, with his, his sampling crew, spent over 1,800 hours uh, surveying and they collected over 300,000 mussels, nine different species. Now, this is kind of extrapolation, obviously. They, uh, they don't go out and sample the entire bottom, but what they do is uh, do a randomized sample where well, they put a, a one square meter, a square PVC, I guess, meter on the, on the ground and collect mussels, and they extrapolate that out. But what they did was um, they figured, even though they caught, I think, nine different species, yeah, nine species, 98% of the mussels with this elliptio componata, as you see in the picture here, it's a very common mussel on the East Coast. Um, and by his survey, he figured that there was upwards of 280 million elliptio componata mussels in the Delaware River, or about 2.2 million mussels per mile. And based on filtration rates, he estimated they could filter throughout the Delaware River six times a day. And really, the only host species for American eel or for these mussels of American eel. Now mussels, um, I'm not sure how familiar with you are with them, but are basically freshwater oysters. They filter water out. Um, and like oysters, they can't really move. Oysters rely on currents to move um, their spat up and down the, the bay, the tidal river, or the tidal currents to move their spat. Mussels can't do that because the spat would only go downstream, the glycidia. So mussels have an interaction with fish and they use, um, many mussels only have a few host species that they use. Well, I told you that American eel migrate from the ocean to freshwater streams. And so if you think about it, that makes for a great host for a mussel because they're traveling long distances and they're also on the bottom. So these elliptio have adapted to use mussels or use American eel as a host for their uh, larvae and carry these larvae up and down the river. 
which is kind of amazing. I forgot to add the next slide in here. But um, anyway, the Susquehanna River, even though it's right next to the Delaware River, doesn't have these mussels in it. They're practically gone. Even though we find records, uh, I guess, in colonial camps, uh, Indian camps or settlements where we see these mussels, mussel shells along the Susquehanna River. So there was some confusion or some questions as to why these mussels weren't common in the Susquehanna when they're so prevalent in the Delaware River. And it's theorized and in fact, very, very likely that the reason we don't see these mussels in the Susquehanna is because of the construction of Congo Dam and the other three main stem dams on the river, which was built in the 1930s or late, late 20s, 1920s. Um, we've essentially blocked off the mussels from going, or the eels from going up the Susquehanna. And then these mussels have since died out, which is kind of crazy. But if we could filter out the Susquehanna River six times a day, imagine how much cleaner the bay would be. And so we we're aware of that now, and we're building eel ladders on Conowingo. We're collecting um, thousands of eels. So somewhere up times up to 100,000 eels at Susquehanna River. We're putting them in tanks with these mussels to uh, get Glochidia, the baby mussels, onto the eels and releasing those eels into Pennsylvania to uh, establish themselves, establish new populations in the Susquehanna River. So I just thought this was really interesting. I, hopefully I explained that well enough to follow, but um, really cool piece of, I guess, life history with mussels and how we can help maybe improve the quality of the, of the watershed in the bay. So a majority of the fish passage projects have focused on the anadromous fish. Historically, that's why the program uh, began. But now we're kind of shifting focus to also include resident fish to try and open up passages for American eels as well. Uh, we're looking at projects that affect brook trout, uh, rare, threatened, and endangered species. Um, so we're really kind of expanding our, our grasp and our focus on projects to not just focus on shad and herring any longer. And this graph shows some of the work we've done in the Bay Program um, recently. So kind of excited about that. We're one of the few Bay Program groups that are, are meeting and exceeding goals, and we're, we're pretty proud of that. We've got this really handy prioritization tool that we spend a lot of time developing. And uh, we use over 39 different metrics to include upstream habitat, the presence of target fish below a dam, uh, the quality of habitat upstream, the number of blockages, the number of impervious, impervious services in the watershed to try and prioritize blockages. We can use this tool to rank for anadromous fish, brook trout projects, and resident fish projects. And this has been really helpful to give a, um, a I guess a really good uh, unbiased approach of which blockages are the best to take out. So I've kind of wrapped up the fish passage program in a nutshell. I'll, I'll pause here for a second to see if there's any questions or comments or anything you want to ask now. <coughs> and I'll take a drink of water. And then I'll talk about the Whitehall Dam. Well, I think that there, we're going to have a lot of questions. I have I have a whole ton of questions waiting, but we'll let, we'll, we'll wait till you get finished, and we'll do questions after. Okay, I'll keep going then. So the Whitehall Dam um, was 10 feet tall, 125 feet wide, drainage area 46 square miles. It was no longer needed and wanted by the and landowner, and it's one of the few projects where the landowner came to DNR to ask for removal. Uh, most of the time, I go out to dams uh, that are on our list and, and ask for permission to take them out or build a fish ladder, and owners have no interest in doing that. They don't want to take their dams out. They, they like the impoundments, and they, they want to keep it. So this was uh, very unique and was very welcomed. Uh, the primary target species <laughs> excuse me, was American eel. It did have some benefits to trout with thermal pollution and um, brown trout, but also resident fish and uh, stabilized <coughs> stream banks in the impounded area. Excuse me. Here's the Whitehall Dam, a picture from 2004. That's me. Uh, this is my first year in the, uh, in the fish passage program. Uh, Baltimore City, this is the gunpowder watershed, uh, Lock Raven down here. And um, that's the Whitehall Dam way up here in the little gunpowder watershed. Another shot of the Whitehall Dam. Again, not a very uh, large dam. Um, if you look in the background here, you'll see, I'll have a better picture later on, but you can see this bank here with some pretty severe erosion. 
and there's a building here where that erosion was kind of jeopardizing the building a little bit. That was part of the reason to take the dam out as well. Here's another shot of that bank here. Um, this river was on a big bend here, and uh, the river would, the water would come down this uh, side here, river left, I guess it is, hit this bank and really tear at it. And uh, some of these telephone poles were in jeopardy of coming into the river, and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of land left for that, that building there. Again, another shot of it. Uh, you can see some of the issues with the erosion here. So that was a, a big part of the, the removal. You can see this bend here. The river is coming downstream from right to left, and it makes that really strong turn toward the dam. So part of the restoration process was to straighten that river out just a little bit and take some stress off of that bank. Uh, we got grant money through the Bay Program and others to hire a consultant firm, um, prepare our designs, met on site, and, and got a plan. Meeting here with the landowner, again, see that bank there, that big concern. This was the conceptual design that we ended up going with. Um, the river did come down here, and this is the dam. So we kind of tried to route the dam around, or the river around the dam a little bit. We actually took the dam down to grade level and then left some of it down below which is as a stabilizing feature uh, and planted it over it. And we constructed these rock veins to try and slow the water down and re reduce the velocities in the river and also keep the river from head cutting. The dam is pictured here on the right hand side. The first thing we did was create a bypass channel around the dam to uh, let us work in this area in the dry. In this picture in the bottom right, the dam is kind of um, behind the backhoe bucket. So with the water going around the dam, we came in with um, hydraulic hammers, demolished the dam down to just below the water surface, created rubble and then took the rock out. Um, we came through and used some of the rubble put in behind the dam to try and uh, stabilize and keep it from washing away and keep our river on the, the other side where we wanted it to go away from that, away from that eroded bank. Uh, the engineer we worked with this project, we worked with before, he was very picky about his rocks. These rocks really have to be stacked very precisely um, because if you get a lot of water leakage through the rocks, you won't have water going where it needs to go uh, for fish passage. And so he, he would actually go to the quarry and he would hand mark the rocks he wanted to use and be brought in on flatbed trucks. Um, and then they would go ahead and grade the banks. And these rocks would go way into the bank further than you see here to keep the river from going around the rocks that we put in place. Uh, we have this matting that we put down also to try and stabilize it and plant. But again, these rocks go way into the bank further than what you just see towards the end of the project. But this was all done in the dry while the water is going through that bypass channel we talked about. The, the, the way these are supposed to work, as you see, it's higher here at the left it tapers down so it drives the water here in the center. As the water goes up like this, it's designed to push the water back into the channel instead of going off and tearing up these banks here. Again, you can see how these rocks go into the bank and then are seeded over um, just to keep that project stabilized. These are really big rocks that they put in there. These guys with these backhoes are so good, they can pick up single pieces of rebar. It's amazing how well these work, these, these huge machines. We had a um, tropical storm three days after we completed the project. So the project did not have enough time to stabilize. You can see this vein here did not do what we wanted to do, but this was, I think, a 60 or 70 year storm event three days after we put the project in. So did not do well, but we did come back in and fix it and did uh it's since been uh, a great project. This is the post office where we um, put those banks, stabilize those banks, put trees through there. And um, this comes down. These rocks go way back into the bank there to prevent the bank from coming in, pushing the water back and, <coughs> and away from the shore and, and back into the river. And this is about where the dam used to be here. Uh, the dam would be on the right hand side looking upstream and that's it
I had uh, some drone images of that, and I, I couldn't find them. I went to go back out, and um, hold on a second. I got it. Let me turn off my screen sharing. How do I do that? Am I still sharing my screen? Oh, right here. Stop share. I went back out to try and get some drone shots of that, but I had an eye infection on Monday that kind of sidelined me for a little bit, so I couldn't get some new drone shots of the area. You're still on mute, I think. This has been an amazing presentation. I am so excited to learn about everything that y'all have been doing and are doing. I know. I, I, I agree, Rachel. I did, had no idea this was going on. Y'all are the best kept secrets in terms of the of what's going on with the Bay. And we always need some good news going on. And you are our little dash of good news here um, for that. If you have a question, um, you can put it in the chat box or raise your hand and I'll call on you. We did have one here. Judy asked, how long did the Whitehall removal um, uh, process take? And is it, I guess, it, it, are they if it's similar sizes? Do they take the same or? This one was actually one of the smaller projects we've done. Uh, we've done some really big projects in the dam removal process, but I want to say this one was a month start to finish. It didn't take that long. And Richard has his hand up. Richard, go ahead. Unmute. Sorry, yeah, I was going to do that. Um, all of my questions are going to be on the Susquehanna. This is so great. I'm, I'm old enough that I fished off the side of the Susquehanna in the 50s <coughs> when you could uh, catch a shad and take them home. That was a big dinner. And they are very bony. You got to you got to eat. The, the wisdom was you eat bread with it to wash the bones down. Yeah, <laughs> and you you know uh, all of those years since that fish ladder in the middle of the dam there that you showed the video of has been up. I have never seen that operate, and I've spent thousands of hours with a camera shooting birds there. Is it still operational? Yes, they operated um, usually from I guess like March into usually they stop around June. Yeah, and I can I I've, I've been there for this year. The DNR. Uh, it comes and samples the fish and I got to go down and talk to one of the workers and you can I, I asked them how can you tell the sex of a fish and they said oh it's real easy you just squeeze them and I said squeeze them and they said yeah well if they if they put out milk that's a male if they put out eggs that's a female but yep, on the Hartford true. County side there's also a lift of fish <laughs> uh, there is yes so uh they have four big cistern tank trucks that they tell me that they put them in there and they drive them 40 miles upstream, uh, yep. I, I assume, to help the migration. That's correct. So this is actually kind of a neat, I guess, um, I'll, I'll say real quick, the east fish lift is kind of in the middle almost of the river, even though it says it's the east. That's the one I showed you the video of. Yeah. But originally before that, that was what's called a west fish lift. And what they would do before the other dams upstream had fish lifts, they would catch the fish at Conowingo, put them in trucks and truck them upstream all above all four dams. Yeah, and that yeah. actually was working pretty good. I think in the late 2000s, they were seeing around 200,000 fish below the dam passing each year. Wow. Um, when the east fish lift they opened up, they stopped doing the trucking. The problem was the fish would use Conowingo, only a percentage, remember I showed you how inefficient these ladders are, They'd go to the next dam upstream and only a fraction would use that one. And then the third dam, only a fraction of that one. So we actually saw a decrease in production when that ladder opened up. So then they've now since gone back up to trucking. Interesting. Um, Interesting. Yeah. I, I, the second thing is about the eels. I never knew that. Here, six months ago, uh, a Baltimore TV station uh, sent a reporter out there and showed they put a six inch pipe and they shoot water into the Susquehanna and that makes the eels think there's a bypass to get around the dam. So they put a wire cage or something and that's how they collect them. And the story was that the Susquehanna watershed has pearl mussels in them and these eels go over the beds of mussels they get caught in their gills. And that's why they have to put the eels upstream because that's how you get the, the mussels upstream is that all true? That, that was the way he explained it on TV, at least. 
Oh, um, yeah. So the muscles spit out glycidia that go into the gills of the eels, and that's how they, the muscles get their populations back upstream. <coughs> yeah, that's it. That's just so, so neat to see. You have a good job. I wish I had your job. Thanks. I love it. <laughs> um, I want to show you something really quick while we ask the next question. But I, to speak about um, Conwingo more specifically, I did another presentation recently. Can you guys see this? Yep. Yeah. Um, so invasive species are a big thing now, and uh, especially a hot topic for the Susquehanna. And while I'm talking real quick, I'll show you. Um, these are the numbers of snakehead caught in the fish of the Susquehanna River. Uh, you can see 2014 all the way to 2023. You can see the increase of snakehead at Conowingo, um, a drastic increase. And you can also see the increase of flathead catfish, which are also another invasive fish that are creating havoc right now um, in the bay. So I just want to bring that up. And since they, they've got so bad now at the east fish lift, where I showed you that graph, they now dump the fish into a sorting tank to get rid of the invasive fish, then put the fish into a truck instead of letting them go upstream by themselves. Um, I'm not sure mm. if you guys have been watching the news, but the governor of Westmore is calling the federal government declaring the expanding populations of invasive fish species, including blue, head, blue catfish, flathead catfish, and snakehead to be an ongoing commercial fishery disaster in, the, in Maryland waters of the bay. So these uh, snakehead are really expanding all across Maryland. But this data shows what's going on specifically at the Cutting Dam fish lift. Yeah, um, this is this is the that's the lift on the <laughs> county side, and I've got video yeah. of literally hundreds of spawning snakeheads down there. But they didn't tell me. Say again, what do they do with the snakeheads when they catch those in this lift? Do they kill them or throw them back or what? They actually take these fish out and they um, save them and they give them to charities. They they donate them. Ah, so somebody yep. eats them, I guess. Yeah, yep. yep. they have a big refrigeration unit there. Every day they pull out the snakehead, flathead, and bluehead catfish, put them in um, like plastic uh, containers, almost like food containers, and then they're taken to local um, land uh, food banks for food. Well, thanks. That's, that's a new fact. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Rachel, you have your hand up, go ahead. I was trying to phrase this in the chat and figured it might be easier to articulate. So maybe this isn't fair to the fish and the populations of eels, but I have a memory of us doing um, essentially like, uh, oh, I can't think of the word for it. When they go create oyster beds in the bay to try to improve it and bring the population back, do we do stuff like that with mussels like upstream in the rivers and bypass the whole, the eels aren't bringing the mussels there, so we'll do it ourselves? Um, so one of the concerns with oysters in the bay where they do the oyster reefs, uh, one problem with oysters decline is because there's not enough hard substrate in the bay. Uh, they get covered up with silt and uh, there's not enough, I guess, substrate for the oysters to cling to. So they build these artificial reefs and then they try and seed them with oysters that they raise in hatcheries. Um, the problem with the mussels is that uh, they're just not getting upstream because the fish are being blocked by the dams. So um, while I'm talking, I'll try and find a picture of the eel ladder there. But um, so at Susquehanna, what they do is they catch the eels at the dam. They get really high numbers of them there. Um, when they collect the eels, the baby, I'm sorry, the baby eels, they put them in a tank and then they put them in a tank with the mussels. So the mussels basically release their glycidia onto the eels. <clears throat> they leave the mussels there, take the eels out, they truck them upstream to where they would naturally go, and then dump them. And as the eels disperse naturally into the streams, the baby mussels drop off as they are intended to do and then repopulate that. The problem is mussels are so slow to grow that um, it takes you know, several years before you can actually see a baby mussel on the bottom. But we have gone back and done sampling. We are seeing it and making a difference. It's just going to take a long time, but it's it's very, I'm very optimistic about it. Jim, the, the, you said that the 
dams are owned, are private land, are owned by private people. Can you explain that? Because I thought that that rivers were not, how can people own our rivers? Yeah, so they don't own the river, but they can own the structure. So almost most of the dams that we have are privately owned. The, the easy pickings, a lot of the work we've done so far with building the fish ladders or taking out dams have all been mostly um, publicly owned dams, like state owned dams, or it's owned by a county or the army or something like that, or municipalities. So the ones we have left now are largely privately owned and it's very difficult to get permission to take them out. Now, Maryland has a law that says uh, we have the authority to come in and tell you to construct a fish passage device or remove a dam at our discretion. But unfortunately, it's not very well, it, it's, we don't have a, the teeth to enforce it, I'm, I'm, I'm told, um, unfortunately. So did the private people build are allowed to build a dam or I mean, could if, if I lived on the river, I could just go ahead and put a dam in wherever I wanted and nowadays no nowadays it'd be much more difficult to build a dam and if you were to build a dam now you might be required to build an, a fish ladder as part of the process um back when most of these dams were built though that wasn't the case the, and, and a lot of times people who own the dams, you know, they never, they didn't build them. They just kind of inherited with the property. And so in some cases, people don't even know they own the dams. And before everybody got on, Jim and I were talking and there's over 800 dams still left in Maryland uh, in waterways. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Many, many dams in Maryland. Um, there's uh, over 800 dams and we probably have well over 1,600 blockages total if you include culverts. You mentioned that salmon were once in Maryland. Was that, or did I mishear that, or did I? We did have populations of Atlantic salmon. They weren't really strong in Maryland. Um, in fact, I, I guess I can't say for sure that we had Atlantic salmon in Maryland, but we did have them along the East Coast. I'm trying to find a picture of the uh, Susquehanna eel ladder, because it's pretty neat to see. So when the so the dams do they cause a problem when for the eels if they're going back into sea for spawning? Yes. Um, so at Conwingo, for example, when um, when we pass a fish or an eel upstream of the dam, um, <coughs> especially the herring, like the adult herring, adult sh adult shad, if they go upstream above all four main Susquehanna dams, the probability of survival for an adult is near zero. Unfortunately, the survivability of the larvae fish is pretty high. With American eel, it's not very good. They get chopped up. Now, they're trying to work with Exelon to have one of the floodgates open to try and get eels to go over. They do tend to kind of out migrate towards the surface, we, we think. Um, and if they did that, they would have some better survivability, but it's still not great. So, that is, that is one of the big problems by getting them up there. But we're only passing a fraction of the fish that I guess are below the dam. And we are getting that muscle benefit by bringing the muscles, or bringing the eels upstream with the muscles attached. Is there any thought or talk about removing the even the Conowingo Dam, something that large? Uh, I would. No, unfortunately. Now, the Conway Dam will be there uh, for a very long time. They're renewing their license now. They are having to put in a bunch of money to try and improve passage there. Um, I can't go into specifics on it, but they are working on ways to try to uh, funnel fish to the ladder to make the ladders more efficient or the lifts more efficient. But yeah, they're not, they're not great. And then that dam won't be going anywhere anytime soon. The Conowingo serves Philadelphia anyway, right? That's a big problem. <laughs> yep, yeah, I think it does serve Philadelphia. That's correct. Yep, electricity. Richard, do you have another question? Oh, that, that was that was my comment. <coughs> um, how do they sample for when when you showed that map and showed the the eels? How do, what is the sampling technique used for eels? 
so that's electrofishing. Um, okay. I can pull up a picture of that somewhere, I believe. They basically use like backpack shockers to uh, go in there. It's uh, almost like a backpack uh, Ghostbuster unit, and it sends a mild a shock into the into the river, and um, uh, it temporarily stuns the fish, and then they can, I guess, pull up and and then collect the fish and net it. I'm going to uh, share my screen one more time, um, and I'll show you one of these units. This is another presentation I did, but here's a, a boat electrofisher right here unit. Um, these, can you guys see this? The little antennas into the water. There's a generator yep. that powers that and shocks the water. I can show you another example of this in this video here. I do a lot of presentations at schools and this is a pretty popular video I show. Um, of DNR at work, I call it. Uh, I, filmed a bunch of our units and, and basically took them out and gave a very wide sampling of what DNR does because it does more than just fish passage. And this is uh, raising trout. <coughs> this is electrofishing for largemouth bass survey. You can see the fish are temporarily stunned and then they release back alive. Uh, we do work on the coastal bays uh, with beach saning. We pull a big, we're pulling a trawl there. This is a beach sane here going through and sampling fish. Um, we have a bunch of administrative folks in the office. Uh, we got folks down in coastal bays and we got uh, crazy guys in the hatchery. And these are all uh, largemouth bass here in tanks. Um, baby largemouth bass there. And we even go fishing sometimes to sample fish and tag fish. And here we are sampling below the dam. This is a crew here. Um, we're on a boat, we actually go fishing to catch American Shad. We tag them and based on the number of tags they see at the ladders, they get a really rough estimate of how many fish were below the dam. It's, it's not great. There's a lot of flaws in the, in the science behind it, but it is one way to get some numbers at the dam. Um, try and show you the backpack unit. Here's another electro fishing boat here. Uh, it sends the shock into the water. We can that's a tiger muskie we got on the, on the Potomac River, a large walleye. Uh, we do work with oysters and, and aquaculture, work with the farmers or the aqua farmers for that. Uh, here you'll see the backpack shocker, which we use to survey um, a lot of fish in rivers, including American eel. These guys here, here's a backpack unit shocker. Uh, this guy has a probe that um, shocks the fish, and then there's netters around him to try and collect the fish as they come up to the surface. Uh, we try and have a few backpack shockers and then netters mixed around them. It's a big process because these fish in, the, in fast moving water can really go downstream quick. We use the same technique on boats to collect fish on larger rivers. Here's those electric units again, and that's the unit in the water. Um, I always tell, here's my uh, job coming up here, taking the dams out. This is the Simpkins Dam removal. We use the rubble from that dam to make oyster reefs in the bay. And that's me doing some sampling. Uh, I'm looking for fish eggs right there with a larval net. And then here's a whale knee crop we did on Astig Island. And the kids always get a big kick out of this one when I show this at schools. Um, but anyway, this is kind of a sampling, a little of what we do at DNR. I agree that you have a really cool job. I love it. Richard it asked you a lot. Do you allow people to contact you for info? Because you'd be a super source for his stuff or Hannah book. Absolutely, yeah. And then I can definitely, if I'm not the person to talk to, I can generally put you in contact with the, the person who is. Uh, do you work with Mary Groves? I do, yep. Mary was actually in that video. If I might have went past her, but she's in that video. Yeah, I thought I saw her. I thought I saw her. She, uh, she did a presentation on, on the catfish uh, of Maryland for us, uh, right. too, right. as well. Yeah, she's, she's yeah. a very great resource. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you want to put your uh, email in the chat box if people want to contact you with the different questions? Yep, there you go. All right. <coughs> Any other questions?
questions for Jim. And spread the word. You know, if you have a, somebody who owns a dam, um, you know, we can take it out at little to no cost and many times, and it, it's not as bad as they think. We can show you before and after pictures, and um, you know, help benefit the resources. Yeah. Well, Jen, uh, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for giving us uh, insight into what's going on on our rivers. We're so super um, excited and, uh, and thankful for all of the work that you and your team have been doing and continue to do to make our, our stream safe for our fish friends. Um, and we're looking forward to learning more about what's going on in the future, especially with the eels uh, passages and how that evolves. Um, so stay tuned. We might be coming back to you to get some more info. I'd love it. Yeah, anytime. And thank you all for joining us uh, tonight on Must Learn Thursday. Hope to see you next week. Next week, next Thursday is the moon. So we're going to the moon um, for National Moon Night. But hope maybe we'll see you in person this weekend at Shark Fest at the museum. So we can, uh, it's a different kind of fish. Um, and we'll see you then. Until then, stay, stay, stay well, stay safe. Stay curious and stay outside. All right, everybody, take care. Bye bye. All right, see you guys. Thank you, Sarah.